Welcome back. In this section, we're going to be discussing the implicit keyword. First, we're going to talk about basic implicit parameters. Then we'll talk about how implicit parameters work together with other features to bring us type classes. Finally, we're going to talk about implicit classes and object extensions. So let's start with basic implicit parameters. We'll look at how the compiler treats implicit parameters, some high-level overview of how implicit resolution works, and why we would use implicits at all. Let's get started. First off, let's talk about how you declare an implicit parameter. I can declare a function, a, that takes a regular parameter, like hello, that is a string. But I can also give it a second argument list and have it start with the word implicit. This implicit says, I want to be able to specify hello in the call. So the caller needs to give me something for hello. But for goodbye, the caller needs to give me nothing. It's something that the compiler can plug in for the caller if the caller opts into it. They can give me that parameter, but they don't necessarily have to, depending on what their setup looks like. So we'll complete this little basic example by just returning hello and goodbye. So if I try to call right now A with hello as the string, we get an error from the compiler. It tells us it couldn't find an implicit value for that parameter. Now to get this out of the way, we can go ahead and fill it in ourselves explicitly. Just like that, it works just as if there were a second parameter list with no implicit declaration on it. But I can also declare an implicit val. Uh, we'll call it my implicit string and set it to goodbye. And then I can call hello. And the compiler, when it sees that a has an implicit parameter that is a string, looks for a string in scope that has that type and can be filled in and is declared as implicit, which means that it can be filled in for another implicit parameter. So it matches the implicit request in the declaration, I want an implicit value that is of type string, with what's in scope. So when we declared this, we said, I have an implicit value for anyone who wants an implicit string, and it is goodbye. Now, there's a way for us to sort of explore what implicits are in scope at any point. It's this implicitly helper. Implicitly just takes a type and then checks the implicit scope to figure out what would be plugged in for any implicit parameter of that type in this current scope. So implicitly string, goodbye, because we declared that up here. Implicitly, uh, let's say option int, we don't have one of those. What about uh, any other basic types? So out of the box, there are very few implicits in scope. But there's a more interesting possibility here, which is that you can have implicits that are looked up by the type that is passed to a parameterized class. So option would be an excellent example. If we wanted to, we would be able to define an implicit for option int, not just for option. A great example of where this is taken advantage of is when we're trying to sort a list. So let's take list 321 and call sorted on it. We get a sorted list back, one, two, three. The question is, how does sorted know what to use to compare each element in the list? Well, if we hit tab twice here, we'll see the declaration and we'll see that sorted actually takes an implicit parameter. It takes an ordering. So we can explore this here by saying implicitly ordering int. And we'll see that we get a plugged in value that comes from the ordering singleton. 
we can also see if there are any other orderings. So string, for example. There is one. What if I declare my own case class? And uh, it comes with a string parameter. Can I get an implicit ordering for that? No. So ordering has a way of giving us some default orderings that are automatically available through this implicit resolution mechanism. What is interesting to ask at this point is, okay, how do we figure out which implicit we're going to use? And there's sort of a hierarchy of lookups that happens when we ask for an implicit of a particular type. So first, we look for implicits in scope. So let's say that I defined a new int ordering. And it's an ordering int. And let's go ahead and just do this and see what we need to implement. We need to implement compare. It takes an int. It takes two ints rather, and it returns an int. So let's implement that. x int y int int equals, uh, and we'll just define it as y minus x. So now we have this int ordering. Let's do an implicit lookup again of an ordering int. Notice that this time, the one that we resolved to is the one that we declared up here. Any implicit val that you declare in the current scope is going to take precedence over any other implicit val that's declared. We can also import an implicit declaration. So let's say I created an object, my object, and inside it I declared an implicit val uh, double ordering, and it's an ordering double, and it compares a double, two doubles basically, an x and a y and it returns an int. And what we do is we say y minus x to int. So if I go implicitly ordering double, I get an ordering that's provided by the ordering singleton. But I can bring this into scope by saying import my object dot underscore. Now if I say implicitly ordering double, we get the one that we defined in my object. Let's say we define another object. Oops. And this one also has a double ordering. And it looks the same. For our purposes, we won't bother making them different. But we want to see what happens First off, if we do it now, nothing should change, right? We've not added anything to the scope. We're still resolving the my object double ordering. What happens if we do another object dot double ordering and we import it explicitly? Now it's another object's ordering that gets resolved. So let's do a third version of this and see what happens if I import a third object dot underscore. Again, a third object is the one that wins. So basically when we're doing, when we're looking at imports, it's whatever the most recently resolved import is uh, that can provide an implicit of this type, that's the one that's going to give it to us. So that's pretty easy. Notice the other question is, do imports win against things that are in the local scope? So we declared our uh, implicit int ordering right up here, okay? So if we do implicitly ordering int, we're gonna resolve this uh, implicit int ordering that we declared up here. 1cf6971b, 1cf6971b. What if we do uh, int object and we declare the same kind of int ordering in here and import int object dot underscore? We see the int object is the one that wins. So even though we declared an implicit in scope, 
if we import a different one afterwards, that's the one that'll win. So all of these things are at the same, uh, basically priority level, and it's just the latest one that's been seen that's going to be the one that wins. Now, the original lookup of the ordering int went to the singleton of ordering. So we see that there are some other resolution mechanisms. When I ask for an implicit of a given type, we're going to check in the current scope, but if the current scope doesn't have anything, we're also going to look in the singleton of that type. In this case, we're going to look in the singleton of ordering if we can't find an ordering in the current scope. So that's really helpful. We also look in the singleton of the target type. So if I uh, remember that we created our case class up here, my case class, right? And if we did implicitly ordering my case class, we got no implicit defined. Well, we can't open up the ordering singleton to add a my case class implicit, but we can define an ordering in my case class. Uh, as long as we just do it in the singleton. And so here we do my ordering, uh, my case class. And when we compare x, my case class, to y, my case class, we want to return an int. Well, my case class has in it, if you'll remember, one parameter, and it's a string. So really, we can say that comparing two, of, in two instances of my case class is the same as comparing the strings inside them. And we know that there's a built-in way to compare the instances inside them. So we'll get into how we can use that in a generic way in a minute. But first, let's say implicitly ordering string dot compare x dot string y dot string. So now we've delegated the ordering of my case class to the ordering of strings that are inside my case class. Now, if I do this again, we won't find it because it's still in the object. Uh, actually, no, because we are not resolving the actual type my case class, interestingly. And I don't know why that is happening. Now, if we wanted to define uh, an ordering on the singleton for my case class, we could do it. But we need to redefine that case class. My case class string. And then we define the singleton. And we give it an implicit val MCC ordering. And it's a new ordering of my case class. And uh, that ordering is going to work just like our other ones. It takes an x my case class and a y my case class. Now what we know at this point is we just have one string inside these case classes. So really comparing two case classes can be the same as comparing two strings. What we would like is to delegate the ordering of my case class to the ordering of the strings inside it. And we can do that with the implicitly helper that we've been using for debugging by saying implicitly look up an ordering of strings and then compare x and y. And that's how we compare the case classes. So let's close this out and see what we've got. Notice that uh, we find ourselves in a situation where the MCC ordering doesn't work because we're still trying to compare X and Y. So we're trying to use X and Y instead of X.STR and Y.STR. What this is telling us is that it was trying to compare two MCCs, but it was doing it with uh, an ordering that's meant to take a string. So this works correctly, and now let's see what happens if we ask for an implicit ordering of my case class. Just like that, it works exactly like we'd expect. Now, one interesting note is that this implicit is not using the full implicit resolution mechanism. If we use, if we define a different ordering of strings in this context, then it won't be used. 
if we wanted to allow others to define their own ordering of strings and to have that be reflected in the ordering of my case class, we actually can define a recursive implicit lookup. So we can change this from a val to a def, and we can have it take an implicit string ordering that is an ordering of string, and we can use that string ordering here. And if we do the same situation here, we'll get the right thing. So what happens in this case is, when we declared this initial one, implicitly ordering string will apply to whatever context we declared the implicit val in. So when we first create the singleton object, we're going to create this implicit val. And when we create this implicit val, it's going to have a certain implicit scope. And that's where we're going to look up ordering string. When we change this to be a def that takes in an implicit, we said whoever the caller is can actually override the way strings are being ordered. And if they choose to override the way that strings are being ordered, then that also overrides the way that case classes are being ordered. So these are some of the ways that you can stack these implicits on each other uh, to make things that are occasionally a little bit confusing, but if you've structured your system right, they make sense. So they fit together in the way that you would expect them to fit together. In this case, it might not necessarily be obvious to the person consuming your case class that a change in how they want to order strings in their lists will also apply to how the case classes are ordered. So you may not want to do it this way. But there are other cases where that is the right thing to do. And so you have the power to be able to set up all those interactions if you want them to. And the compiler will take care of plugging in the right implicits when they are requested. That's it for basic implicit parameters.